It's been almost a year since Bayonetta Origins, Cereza and the Lost Demon was released, and I'm still surprised that it exists. In the very short time between the game being announced and hitting shelves, I voiced my hesitation towards essentially every aspect of it. I didn't think the new direction was a good idea, I didn't think focusing on the new lore was a good idea, the new gameplay style, the new look, the new characters, nothing about what was being presented felt like it was a good idea and could possibly succeed. It was maybe the most sceptical I'd ever been of a game before it had even come out, but I quietly held out hope that the one thing it might achieve would be cleaning up some of Bayonetta 3's mess. Cereza and the Lost Demon is intrinsically connected to Bayonetta 3. It was first shown off as a hidden easter egg inside Bayonetta 3, announcing itself there before it even got an official trailer. And even from the early details, it seemed to be closely tied to the fairies, a newly introduced species in Bayonetta 3 that were lacking much explanation or context. Bayonetta 3 is an incredibly divisive and controversial game. It's loved by many, hated by some, but from what I've seen, most people are mixed, liking some elements of the game while being critical of others. But the one aspect that seems to unite most people who've played through it is that the story is kind of a mess. This can largely be accredited to introducing a multiverse narrative and twisting this around the series' already quite complex lore to make a story that is incredibly hard to follow, especially if you aren't paying close attention or reading side content, and practically impossible if this is where you choose to start the Bayonetta series. So, this left Bayonetta Origins perfectly primed to be the extra piece needed for Bayonetta 3 to make at least a bit more sense. If this spin-off prequel could do one thing, it could potentially be the game to even slightly improve the legacy of this franchise's new black sheep. As it turns out, my scepticism for Cereza was misplaced. Every aspect of it I was worried about ended up being overshadowed by the quality of the game, and it turned out to be a highlight of my 2023. So, while I hoped Origins would be the saving grace of Free's story, after finishing the prequel, why is my opinion of Bayonetta 3 worse than when I started? Before going into Origins' impact on Free, it's important to understand why it works, because it really shouldn't. Cereza and the Lost Demon is like nothing else in the Bayonetta series. I feel like a fucking celebrity in this town. <laughs> <laughs> but it takes this contrast in its stride. It fully commits to the storybook aesthetic, and by doing this, becomes one of the best looking and most visually cohesive games on the Switch. It could have gone for full motion cutscenes, but instead used storybook style half motion slideshows. These not only fit in with the theming, but help keep within the game's likely more limited budget, but are also reminiscent of the flashback scenes in Bayonetta 1. I didn't really click with the visuals of the game when looking at footage, seeing it as just another stylized indie aesthetic game, but when you actually play it, it works so well. A lot of games are designed for trailers, with big flashy moments to entice players to buy. However, games like this, and Hades or Tunic, might look alright in screenshots and trailers, but when you're in control, the visuals make perfect sense. Pulliam Moore describes it as inspired and beautiful, and Donlan describes it as lovely, generous, playful, and extremely beautiful. Even Henley's otherwise negative review points out, We're so used to judging video games by how realistic they are, how precise their final details are, that we sometimes lose our appreciation for coloration, cinematography, and coherent aesthetic choices. The UI also fits perfectly with the whole concept to make something which clearly had a lot of effort behind it, something Donlan also recognised, saying, There is luxurious care here rising off the page. In bigger games, sometimes areas can start to feel asset-y and a little copy-pasted, but thanks to the scale of Origins, you never feel that, with every corner of the map being unique, and little touches like different fast travel animations for each location displaying the attention to detail. The character models slide perfectly into their setting, but what I was even happier to see were the enemy designs. In the main trilogy, I think the quality of enemies get progressively worse. The focus on just angels in the first game worked amazingly, and I remember a lot of those designs vividly. In 2, demons were added to the mix, and they were fine, but only a couple stuck out. And by 3, I don't think any Bayonetta fan would say that the homunculi are their favourite enemy class, with my memory of them just being a teal turquoise blob. 
So seeing Cereza introduce another enemy class with fairies, I was frustrated that it was another new faction. But these enemies were so visually strong, not reaching the highs of angels, but better than most demons and a vast improvement from the homunculi. I would regularly find myself screenshotting new enemies, with the bosses especially looking jaw-dropping, and again fitting into this setting so well. And while I'm not able to speak technically on the quality of the music, the soundtrack is varied and long, meaning that every moment of the game has a score that's perfectly suited to what's going on, further cementing the immersive atmosphere this game has. But a game just can't look and sound good, and that's why it's impressive that the gameplay of Cereza and the Lost Demon works so well. When talking about it, I've struggled to find anything to compare it to. I've described the progression as Metroidvania light, thinking I was being inventive, if not slightly loose with the definition of a Metroidvania, only to discover that Tom Reagan's review uses the exact same phrasing as well. But it's not just a Metroidvania, its combat and platforming is similar to Astral Chain, a title also from Platinum Games, but simplified to fit the setting and length of the game. It also features sometimes hidden, sometimes obvious, puzzle or combat mini dungeons in the form of Tiernanogs, reminiscent of shrines in modern Zelda games, all blended with environmental puzzle solving exploration. It's nothing like other Bayonetta games, but it's also nothing like anything else I've ever played at all. Maybe Okami is comparable in some aspects, but not enough to feel that close, even though that would make sense with Okami being developed by a lot of Platinum Games veterans. While I'll focus on the narrative and characters more later, it's worth mentioning here that I love how our core duo of Cereza and Cheshire are characterised to not feel two-dimensional. Their immaturity is built up to be believable, making them imperfect protagonists that keep the story engaging because we're following them. It's not without its flaws, while I love how the lack of a minimap emulates the childlike feeling of being lost in a forest, there could have been some quality of life additions, even as a post-game unlock, to make navigation simpler. And while I do like the voice the narrator uses for Cheshire, I also wish that he got a dedicated voice actor like some of the other main characters. But because the overall package resonated with me so much, I can overlook these gripes to appreciate everything else. Especially since the game wasn't long enough for these issues to get grating enough to be anything substantial. So if I'm so fond of Cereza and the Lost Demon, why did it impact my opinion of Bayonetta 3 so negatively? <laughs> I mentioned that Bayonetta 3 is a polarising game, and its flaws have been debated since before it even came out, so I'm not going to dedicate any more time to beating this long deceased Umbran horse. However, I will quickly reiterate the narrative problems with Bayonetta 3 within the context of issues which Bayonetta Origins could have cleaned up. Of course, another game is incapable of fixing many issues with a separate product. If you didn't like the gameplay, the pacing, or the graphics in Bayonetta 3, a prequel isn't going to help with that. However, one of the most consistent complaints about Bayonetta 3 is its narrative, a narrative that needed more context. Bayonetta 3 is an undoubtedly ambitious project, and in a gaming sphere that regularly churns out overly safe projects, that's something I can appreciate, and in some areas I think that helped it, but in other areas, like the story, it ended up creating some pretty inescapable issues. The narrative of Bayonetta 3 sets up a lot of threads, and with it being a multiverse-focused story, that makes sense, but that excuse doesn't make it any less messy. There's Viola's story and Jean's story, as well as the sub-stories of every universe's different Bayonetta. Then there's the overarching narrative, which is being experienced by the main Bayonetta we control, but because of how busy everything else is, this Bayonetta spends most of her time playing second fiddle to everything else that's always going on around her. So, by the end of the game, when the overall narrative is coming to a close, as well as the trilogy of Bayonetta, Bayonetta 2, and now 3 also seemingly wrapping up too, it can't help but feel underwhelming while also convoluted. This isn't helped by so many elements of each narrative seemingly coming out of nowhere. For example, Luca and Viola's fairy heritage, and fairies in general. Like, Lucaon is introduced with some fanfare, but it feels unearned, because who the fuck is Lucaon? Viola is never really given that much development either, which is a massive shame since she has potential and has something going on, but isn't given enough time for it to be fleshed out to be anything satisfying. But then she's also given too much time for her to be easy to ignore, since she is a star for multiple chapters, so she's in the awkward place of having too much attention on her, but not doing enough with it to be a properly enjoyable part of the narrative. And by the time we get to the end, and she's reintroduced as the next Bayonetta, it feels like we barely know her, but are simultaneously already a bit tired of her. Which again, sucks, because she could have easily been likeable, and there's a strong foundation there for a fun character, but it just wasn't 
wasn't utilized properly. That's the problem with Bayonetta 3. It has so many promising ideas and concepts set up, but seemingly no one was ever told no and it all got greenlit. And now we've got a story that has to balance everything it started while also juggling a newly introduced multiverse too. It attempts to fix some of these issues by adding or explaining some of the more complex aspects of the story in menus and logs, but I don't think that should be an excuse or a tool for creating a satisfying story. Maybe for adding extra flavour and details, but not anything more important than that, especially when your game is 30% cutscene, almost 4 hours. You have more than enough time to make something that works, but if you can't keep a lid on your ambition, I guess you can't. Bayonetta 3 does have an ending. It certainly has an ending, but it still feels like there are so many loose threads by the time that you're done. Threads which could be contextualised and were seemingly supposed to be contextualised with the prequel. So what happened? While it would have been an impossible task for Cereza and the Lost Demon to be able to clear this all up, it doesn't completely fail to, and it will be a nice shift of tone to focus on positives again. There are smaller ways that Bayonetta Origins enriches the whole Bayonetta universe, which are mentioned by Colbert in his review, explaining, as opposed to other games info dumping the bulk of its lore in codex entries and droves of mind numbingly convoluted exposition by its undercooked villains, Suraza lets you take in information alongside Suraza and Cheshire. It explains concepts like the importance of a witch's hair as a vessel for demons, and seemingly insignificant facts like Rosemary serving as demon repellent in the Bayonetta series play a big role in Cereza as environmental obstacles to overcome. But the main area in which Cereza helps Bayonetta free is by focusing on fairies. This new faction comes completely out of left field in Bayonetta 3, with both Luca and Viola shown to harbour fairy powers, and Lucan being a fairy that comes out of nowhere too. It's unfair to say that fairies are given no context, but they are given very little for the amount of impact they have on the narrative of 3, and that contributes to the lack of clarity 3's whole story has. This is part of the reason why I wish Cereza and the Lost Demon had released before 3, because then the multiple references to fairies would have been a satisfying payoff for playing a side game, instead of being something completely unexplained. It wouldn't have completely solved the narrative issues, but it would have given some more of that aforementioned clarity it needed. Introducing Lucan and the fairies in Cereza isn't a perfect problem solver, and we'll get to that later, but it does help to have a whole game focused on this new group in the Bayonetta universe. The other main issue with Bayonetta 3 it addressed is Jean. Unfortunately, Jean has a very minor role in Cereza and the Lost Demon until an optional story unlocked after beating the game. That takes about an hour to complete. It's a shame it's kept so late since it's the clearest connection to Bayonetta 3, with that game's antagonist, Singularity, making an appearance as a boss for Jean to defeat. As well as hinting at a potential connection between the fairies and Singularity, it also contextualises Jean's relatively overshadowed and unceremonious death in 3. I could paraphrase, but Whirly Worlds explained it quite well, saying, Singularity went back in time to take Cereza's power and kill her so the events of Bayo 3 would never happen and he showed Jean a vision of her death in 3 to scare her away, and allow him to follow through with his plan. Jean didn't take the bait, and she did end up killing him, but in doing so, she secured her murder by his hands. In other words, Jean knew she was going to die in Bayo 3, and didn't do anything to avoid it, because her death was necessary to bring Singularity back in time to when she finished him off. Jean having some autonomy over her death in 3 helps make it much less embarrassing for her character. Instead of being a death which didn't get enough fanfare, it's actually an almost lifelong planned sacrifice to ensure the day was saved by the end of 3. Or was it? Because that leads to one of the biggest issues with the relationship between these two games. It was honestly unfair for me to go into Origins hoping for it to fix Bayonetta 3 in any way, so the fact that it succeeded on one level is impressive. Cereza and the Lost Demon is likely done and just getting polished by the time Bayonetta 3 launched, so it couldn't be structured around fixing any reception-based issues 3 had, but unfortunately the two points I just mentioned that it fixes actually are only fixed on a skin-deep level. For me, the main way the introduction of fairies helps Bayonetta 3 is by contextualising Lucan but I can't really sit with that too comfortably because if you've got to the end of Cereza and the Lost Demon, you know Lucan dies at the end because Cereza isn't willing to sacrifice Cheshire for him. This is a great moment narratively and part of the reason why the ending hits so hard, but that means that the canonical events of Bayonetta Origins can't be in the same universe as Bayonetta 3. Instead, it's more likely to be in the ending where Cereza dies and Lucan lives. 
which we can see in a game over screen if you die at a certain point in the game. So sure, Bayonetta 3 is all about multiverses, so Bayonetta 3 is a continuation from that specific game over ending universe of Cereza and the Lost Demon. And I mean, alright, but then that creates some issues as well. If this is the Lucaon who survived by killing Cheshire and Cereza, then that means that Cereza from Cereza and the Lost Demon is dead, and that undoes all of her character development from the end of the prequel since she is now, in fact, dead. So the ending which gives her more confidence, a new hairstyle similar to Bayonetta 1, and learning which time while fighting Morgana, all didn't happen. And it has been heavily theorised that fairies only exist in certain limited universes, further adding validity to this. But if Lucaon survived, creating this alternate dead Cereza timeline, then it also undoes any connection between Jean from the prequel and Jean from Bayonetta 3, since the events are split and these are now different multiverse versions of the characters. So instead of Jean choosing to die in free and this being an autonomous, lifelong planned sacrifice, it's instead Jean from Bayonetta 3 being collateral for a decision being made by a completely different child version of her from an alternate universe. This means her death is still humiliating, because if Liu Kaon is alive, then the version of her that allowed Jean to die in Bayonetta 3 wasn't actually her, so it wasn't her brave sacrifice to make. It's inherently confusing and tricky to understand, and it's a great example of why I don't like multiverse narratives, especially when it's used as a get out of jail free card by storytellers. So, from my understanding at least, and feel free to correct me, you can't have Liu Kaon from the prequel alive and also have Jean's death not be unceremonious. And because Liu Kaon is there in free, and there is potentially only one universe for fairies, then I guess it's a first option. Which sucks, not just for Jean, but because it also means that the events of Cereza and the Lost Demon, at least at the end, had no impact on the rest of the trilogy because the canonical ending is actually the one where Cereza dies. Or maybe Liu Kaon just reincarnated, or Jean's story takes place in a different universe and everything can be true, but again, we can't really know that. It's part of the reason why Cereza and the Lost Demon feels like a standalone game that just makes references to the main series. I'm not the only one who thinks this either. In a video designed to help give context for the game by Game Explain, they mirror this, saying, In a way, Bayonetta Origins Cereza and the Lost Demon feels more like a standalone experience, even if it uses elements introduced in 3. The multiverse also helps make Origins feel standalone, as it's unknown which universe this prequel is even set in. And if you do want to connect it to the main series, you're stuck theorising because connecting to a narrative as messy as Bayonetta 3's is inherently difficult, and instead of making Bayonetta 3's story seem better, it just further highlights its flaws. You're enjoying yourself playing a fun spin-off game and wonder to yourself, how does this connect to the main series? And instead of getting a straight answer, you're all of a sudden, with no consent, shoved down a theory rabbit hole. And I love a good theory sometimes. Finding out obscure lore details or learning about potential mysteries in a rich video game setting can be incredibly rewarding for adding depth to the world, but shoot me I guess for wanting a simpler connection between a prequel and a main game. So when you look into it, Bayonetta Origins doesn't really clean Bayonetta 3 up, instead making it seem messier the more thought you put into it. But what about the inverse? Was Cereza and the Lost Demon made worse by its connection to Bayonetta 3? Short answer, no. Cereza and the Lost Demon is still a great game. Unlike 3, it has the luxury of being able to stand alone narratively if you take everything else out of consideration. And by doing this, you get a very satisfying narrative payoff by the end of the game. But what if we consider having context? Because most people who are playing Cereza and the Lost Demon have played Bayonetta 3. We don't have many sales figures for Cereza and the Lost Demon, but what we do have is that it was the 6th best selling game in Japan for its first week back in March 2023, with 6,474 units sold. Compare this to Bayonetta 3 which sold 41,285 copies in its first week in Japan, making it the second best seller for the week in the much more competitive late October, early November the year before, and was eventually announced to have sold more than a million copies worldwide. And it makes sense why it sold more. Fans were waiting for it for around 8 years since Bayonetta 2, and there was a notoriously long 5 year gap between its announcement in 2017 and release in 2022. Then compare this to Origins, which only had 3 months between its official announcement and release. And like I've said before, since it was something so different, it immediately turned off fans of the series who didn't want something like this. 
but I also think it alienated newcomers as well. A title as long as Bayonetta Origins, Cereza and the Lost Demon is hardly approachable, with the use of Origins implying its relationship to a bigger franchise. Also, if they're aiming at a younger audience who would be getting this game as a gift, then Platinum shot themselves in the foot there a bit too. If it's being bought by a gamer, they'll likely know the more adult connotations of the main series and not want to buy something to introduce someone younger, even if this game in isolation is perfectly innocent. And if it's being bought by a more unaware shopper, then they're likely going to choose a more recognisable Switch game for a kid like Mario or Animal Crossing, and they aren't going to be tempted by Bayonetta Origins, Cereza and the Lost Demon. I'm so glad this game got made and released, but I don't get how a competent team released this thinking it was going to reach a sizeable audience with how they marketed it. And that also returns to my original point that most people playing Cereza and the Lost Demon are the small group of more dedicated Bayonetta fans that have almost certainly played free and are going into Cereza and the Lost Demon with that context. That was a position I was in, and I can't speak for everyone that shares these circumstances, but I couldn't help but go into Cereza and the Lost Demon assuming that it would be linked to free. How could you not with it being released not even half a year later? I'm not the only person who went in with this expectation. The Armored Titan asked Bayonetta fans, For those who played it, would you say that playing it will make me look more fondly at Bayo 3's story? Does it flesh out any characters, or some of the story beats overall? Will it fill the hole that Bayo 3's story left me with? This expectation by no means ruined the experience for me. I had a great time with it, but I did keep thinking, how is this going to lead into whatever Free was? Is this a reference to Free? Which timeline is this? And I never really got an answer. It was mostly subconscious, but it was often on my mind when playing through the story, and even though it didn't affect much, I could feel Free's narrative mess melting into Origins. Cereza and the Lost Demon was too niche for a lot of people, and that small audience remaining were left with an experience most of them liked, but one that didn't need to be that exclusive in the first place. More people would have loved Origins, but it's surrounded by so many unnecessary fawns that pushed most potential players away. Too obscure for newcomers, too different for Bayonetta action fans, and after the controversy of 3, not many people were willing to give the franchise's weird new offering a chance when this was such a fresh memory. Colbert said, Cereza is the sweetest chaser Platinum Games could have given me after the sour shot Bayonetta 3 left in my mouth. But no one is going to bother for a sweet chaser when they think they're going to have to jump through so many hoops. While Bayonetta 3 didn't make Origins worse, it did add to its burden and instead of being another jewel in the Switch's crown, it's much more likely to be an underrated gem. Just like Bayonetta 3, Bayonetta fans are split on Cereza and the Lost Demon. For example, with the gameplay, Pulliam Moore says, After a few seconds of moving the Witch Demon duo around, and getting accustomed to thinking of them as two halves of a whole meant to be working in concert, Cereza and the Lost Demon quickly becomes just the right amount of mildly gimmicky to feel both inspired and accessible. But on the same control scheme, Henley complains. Each character uses one thumbstick each, making controlling both unnecessarily difficult and limited, as it halves the number of buttons available to each. And while a lot of people think that the story of Bayonetta Origins makes Freeze more palatable, I just think it makes that game's story look worse by comparison. This isn't that special, people have always disagreed on different things, but I also think that the Bayonetta franchise has a unique quality for being polarising. This is encapsulated by Bayonetta 3 and the ripples from that game are still being felt in different ways, with this impacting how most people experienced Cereza and the Lost Demon. It's worth reaffirming how much I enjoy Bayonetta 3 since it does feel like I've been fixating on its faults. I love the core action gameplay and that carried a lot of the game, but when playing Cereza and the Lost Demon I wasn't reminded of how much I loved the gameplay of 3, instead I was reminded of its flawed narrative because while Cereza and the Lost Demon doesn't really fix anything 3 did, it does reference it. It's in the nature of a prequel for you to be intrigued by how it will lead into what it's prequeling. So you do wonder, how does this Cereza turn into the Cereza we know from the main series? How does Lukawan here connect to Lukawan in 3? How do the fairies here connect to the fairies in 3? And because of how free is, you aren't given a straight answer, and that's why I think Origins reflects badly on it. But why do I blame free for this, and not Origins? While sure, I think Origins could have been tweaked to fit into free better, it has a strong, coherent, self-contained narrative that works well on its own, and free is the opposite of this, so of course I'm going to be more forgiving to Origins' story. 
There is no clean ending to this discussion, just like there's no clean ending to Free, and because of that, not really a clean ending when considering the connection Origins has to the main series. I still love the whole series, Free included, and in some cosmic sense, I enjoy how Free and Origins have now formed their own demonic duology, similarly to how you can enjoy 1 and 2 as a self contained narrative sub series as well. It was an impossible task, and I was unfair to expect Cereza and the Lost Demon to be able to fix Free. But I love how these two games have a relationship that can't be compared to anything else in the industry. In any industry. And while my opinion of Free's story might have worsened, I now have a newfound appreciation for just how impressive its impact was. One, two, three! Thanks for listening to me talk about Bayonetta more. If you haven't seen my first two videos, I'd recommend them both if you enjoyed this. I don't think it's a complete trilogy, and I'll always have something more to say about Bayonetta, since the franchise I just love so much, but I'll save that for now. If you strongly agreed or disagreed or have any questions about anything I said, let me know in the comments, because I'm sure I won't have convinced everyone about everything I said, and I love hearing from other Bayonetta fans, because I think every person has such a different reaction to this weird, divisive franchise. And if you want to hear me talk about games more, or just something to throw on in the background for a while, you can watch my ranking of what I played last year, of course including Cereza and the Lost Demon. Or if you just want to see more of me, or be around for my next Bayonetta video, subscribing would be amazing. Every year I've been on YouTube, I've posted a Bayonetta video on this day, so stick around if you want to see what my third year is like. Thanks to Jay for always being so helpful, it was great to have him in his dulcet tones doing the voiceover quotes again, and thank you Annie for helping me edit the script, you do not want to see what it was like before she got her hands on it, and all of the sources I used, they're all listed in the description if you want to find out more. So thanks for watching, and see you in the next video!